Hello. It's Sherry here. Um, and I'm recording this by the Diamond Creek in the acknowledging the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and who have such a, a long connection to the land the land we call Australia. I was looking for a nice quiet spot to be able to present this and hopefully the, the sound of birds don't disrupt you too much. There was a nice spot that I thought I would record in just 10 metres away but it was a little bit too near the, um, the rolling waters was worried that the um, <laughs> sound of running water might be disrupting for some people. <laughs> so I found a nice little spot here. And today I'm really um, humble. I'm um, really a lot of emotions that I can't quite find the right words for, but there's lots of them there. Um, to be presenting for the PMLD conference. I want to keep my presentation <laughs> simple, straightforward. So I'm talking about HOP, which is the Hanging Out program. Something that grew, <laughs> seeded, um, gosh, I don't know, in, in some ways, 15, 18, 20 years ago, I'm not sure. The Hop book came out in 2008 though. So I want to give you a bit of an idea of what I guess Hop is for me, the Hanging Out program, uh, where it came from, the important qualities of it, um, get you thinking about whether it might be something that you need to use in your settings how it might be used. So to start off with, it's been a long passion of mine to understand better how to be with individuals who have profound intellectual and multiple disability or PMLD as you might use in the UK. I remember the times when I had graduated as a speechy. Um, going out to a house and there being drawers and drawers of object symbol programs, personal communication dictionaries on the shelf, uh, general attitude that the program didn't work because the staff didn't um, roll it out properly or consistently. And from that moment and that overwhelming feeling that 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 didn't help me to know how to engage with the people that I'd come out to see. Got me reading and exploring and further studies to try and understand this whole thing of communication with people with profound intellectual and multiple disability. My role as a speech therapist, speech pathologist, whatever, communication I got reading a lot of the stuff in the deafblind work particularly the work of Van Dyke and you know it sort of blew my mind that the object symbols work had come from his work in the 60s 70s but actually what he said is that it all starts with attunement Coactive movement, being with somebody, feeling with somebody. Anyway, I digress. Come back to the point. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'd done all this learning to try and find out what is it this all about. And I'd learned about intensive interaction and I'd brought it back to Australia to try and share with the service that I was working with. And I'd do presentations and I'd do it and I just couldn't seem to be getting traction. Now at the same time I started doing, I was doing my masters in um, 
something. <laughs> anyway, I was doing some research and I was interviewing some support, support workers <coughs> about what's it like to interact with this person that they, they were supporting. Mm, they would tell me about these things that they would do together. And they'd tell me about some of the complicated things about, you know, feeling like they weren't allowed to do what they felt worked because it went against age appropriateness or normal rules of engagement. Feeling like if, if their manager came into the room, they would have to pull their socks up and stop <laughs> doing what they were doing. And I asked one of them, excuse the helicopter. I asked one of them, so, <laughs> Do you still spend that nice time together? I feel sort of auspicious for it to come right now at this, this major turning point in my story. <laughs> okay. So I asked them, do you still spend that nice time together? And she said to me, when the work is finished. And for me, that was a huge paradigm shift. It, it was a shift in the way that I was thinking about this issue of how do we get better interaction happening. When the work is finished, she was saying to me, whether she knew it or not, that being with people, interacting, mucking around, wasn't perceived as the work. So at the same time, I was working in a day service. And I developed a, a really good relationship with a young guy, Chris, who I really enjoyed interacting with. We didn't share words, we shared touch and sounds and presence with each other. But every time I came into the service, he would be by himself. So I guess that was a problem for me is how do we, how do we get, how do I get more interaction for Chris? So taking upon what they'd said, that interaction wasn't perceived to be part of the work and also taking upon that they were telling me lots of really good examples of interaction, but they would hedge it in, we were just mucking around or we were just doing this. There was a inherent devaluing of interaction. So I came up with hop and you know, all hop is, is I guess a group of people saying, we will commit to spending 10 minutes with this person, giving them our full attention. So I was trying to address that issue that that had sidelined being together as not part of the job to saying actually it is part of the job and when you're doing it it's valued and it's important so with hop you got to get that 10 minutes and also to write it down and i gave it a try at this service so i said okay you can choose who to do it with you can choose when to do it you can choose what to do but all you gotta do is 10 minutes with this person and make sure it happens, that it's not an optional extra. And I guess as, as I was rolling it out, as I was sort of getting the idea, I was thinking about some of the, I guess, what did I call them? The hop attitude. <laughs> These things came out to me. And by the wonders of technology, I'll, I'll write them on the screen somehow at a later point. So the, ha the hop attitude, includes all people benefit from interactions all people want to connect with another person but this is hard for some people enjoying the company of another person is one of the most fundamental communication skills that needs to be supported part of our role in supporting people with multiple disabilities is engaging with them Engagement must be meaningful to the person with a disability and the interaction partner. If the person cannot understand the language 
of the support person, then the support person must adapt their language. It should match the language of the person with a disability and what is meaningful to them. And communicating with the person, or communicating with people with multiple disabilities is everyone's job, including managers, all staff, and even other service users. And it took off. We had staff who were making sure the time happened. They were writing down what they were seeing. They were learning from these 10 minutes of being with the person. They were learning what was working, what the person was tuned into. And they were even sort of coming up with ideas from the time that they spent together with the person. And I knew it was a turning point when they started using hop in their language and they would say, we saw the most amazing hop moment today or so-and-so, two, two of the service users had amazing hop together. And when we were applying it, this is a service that has people with lots of different levels of different disabilities. So people with profound intellectual disability, people with mild intellectual disability, and people began, I guess different people began valuing the time, that 10 minutes that people had with each other. The clients valued that time too because they knew that they might, they might get that time as well. So if they saw a preferred staff member having that time with somebody, you know, they would, they would honour that. They wouldn't bust in. And then going to speak at a conference and... One of the support workers who, you know, is, is, was not a, a swish presenter or anything like that, getting up and just describing what it meant for her. So I knew that hop, this idea of just putting, so I, I, I've got to wipe out that word just, um, putting aside that time, that 10 minutes of just being with a person and reflecting on it is valuable, is important. So in that time, I don't tell people what to do. I don't, you know, I might give them ideas, but it's more about releasing people to use and value what they're doing, use and value the time that they spent with the person. I think you know, so I, so I put together a hot booklet. This is it. Just a little booklet. You can download it. Um, I always say take two copies. One for your desk and one for the toilet. So, you know, if you've got somebody sitting down on the toilet, wants something to have a, uh, have a read of, they can sit down and have a read of this. Because I guess another turning point for me was when my mum read the book. And, and she doesn't work with people with disabilities. And she said, I get it. I get it. I, I get what I could do to be with Chris or another person. I have permission to just sit and be. And I have permission, expectation to celebrate the importance of just being with a person. So we do have a format in here for, for writing down. Um, a very basic format of what happened, what worked well, what didn't work so well and what would you try in the future. And this can be a really handy tool for, I guess, really gathering your evidence. Because, you know, if you want to be doing any of the best practice stuff, you know, if, if you say you're doing supported decision making with somebody, it's got to be based on a knowledge of a person and what better knowledge of a person can you get than sitting with them, spending time with them regularly, seeing what they respond to, modifying yourself to be what they respond to. So I guess HOP can be applied on many different levels, several different levels. So, you know, I'm happy for people to pick up the booklet and just take it to a service and, and say, the time that you spend with a person is valuable.
you know, just reading the hot booklet and reflecting on the value of, of attending to a person. You know, that's sort of like the first level. Implementing HOP on a level where a service, a support worker, a practitioner makes a commitment to spending 10 minutes with somebody and ensuring that happens, that it's not sort of taken over by somebody else. I remember early on saying to the manager, look, if this, if, if your team, <laughs> I got, got a bit hard line, if your team can't spend 10 minutes one-to-one -one with a person, then what's the point of the person being here? So you could have it on that level. So you could have, just read the book. You can have to read the book and implement it. Um, I've also developed a hop workshop. I need to update the hop workshop. It's a two hour workshop and I deliberately call it a workshop. Sorry, I think I just paused for a second. Um, I deliberately call it a workshop rather than training because I'm not there to train people in new knowledge. I'm there to workshop with them, explore with them, interaction. So the HOP workshop, and I'm, I'm happy to share a draft with people about it. I am firming it up so that maybe I can move to a train the trainer so other people can confidently roll out the HOP workshop. So what it is, is two hours. Um, and I spend, you know, the first half hour sort of giving a bit of a background, getting people to reflect on um, what's happened for people with profound intellectual disability in their service, what's happened for people with less severe disabilities, um, exploring why it might be different and how we tend to, you know, celebrate big wins like travel training, but we don't celebrate these winds of somebody staying awake you know and is it is it a problem it is the reason that we're often not as good at talking about the achievements of people with profound intellectual disability because the achievements not might not be as socially valued you know <laughs> somebody having a, a raspberry conversation with another person might not be as valued as getting a job <laughs> is because anyway I, 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 I digress again okay um, so I talk to them about the background of hop and then I get people to go into a role play and so <laughs> I, I say to them okay one of you is going to be the person with profound intellectual disability and you're not going to be able to understand or use speech and the other person's going to be the support worker and they have a just a, a one-line um, scenario so it might be um, you're completely deaf and blind and only alert when somebody actually touches you or it might be you're obsessed with shoes um, so they go into the role play for 10 minutes some people uh, I don't know have a real natural ability to sort of attune to the person role playing the person with a disability some people really struggle. So I might go around the room as this is happening, as everybody's paired up. <laughs> and I might be a distractor, like you might have in a day service. Or I might go in and have, you know, join in with the person with a profound disability to subtly give some ideas to the, the support worker. And then after 10 minutes, actually it usually shortens because people really struggle. And I have to often say to people, you know, the goal, there's two things that I always have to say to people. The goal is not to find out what's on the person's card. The goal is to engage with them for 10 minutes. And they'll, you know, five minutes into it, they'll be off on a, a digressed um, um, conversation. And I'll have to say, nah, you haven't done it. You know, the goal is to continue the interaction, not... <laughs> um, so you're always having to remind people to pull back to the, come back to the role play. And the other thing I always have to remind groups, doesn't matter how many times I say it, when you're the person with a profound intellectual disability for this role play, you don't use and don't understand speech or symbols. Because you'll always get people 
drawing pictures or just talking at the person. So after the 10 minutes, they fill in the, the reflection sheet and then swap over. That's what it takes about an hour. And then the second hour is spent um, reflecting on it. So I, I rule up the, um, the whiteboard and on one side I have a person with a profound intellectual disability and the other side that's a disability support worker. On the top of the page I, I think about things that are working. On the bottom of the page I think about things that don't seem to be working. And the first question I'll put to the group is when you were the person, when you were role playing the person with a profound intellectual disability, what worked? What made you feel good? And I'm not going to tell you what people say. You, you get a whole heap of things, you know. When you're the person with a profound intellectual disability, what didn't work? What was irritating for you? And sometimes there's some, some areas that can fall in both, like talk, you know. When you're a person with profound intellectual disability, what did it feel like when somebody was talking to you or at you? So to some degree, people might feel good when people were talking at them even though they didn't understand the content of speech. Sometimes people might just feel frustrated and angry. Some people can work out, actually I didn't think of anything at all because I couldn't see or hear it with my, with, in my role play. And then I go to the support worker. So when you were the support worker, what felt good in being with the person? Because that's, that's core as well, you know? <laughs> Am I, I'm trying to arrange the words here, but it's important that in communication, it's not the person with a disability feeling good and alone. The support worker has to feel present or satisfied or good or connected. So as a support worker, what felt good? And what felt a bit awkward? What, what didn't feel good? What, what made you worry? And I guess then also exploring this in the context of the policies. So if, you're, if, if we've found out that for the person with a disability, it felt good when people use gentle touch but you're in an organisation that says you're not allowed to use touch. What does that mean? Um, you know, it felt good when the person played with me. Okay, what does your organisation say about play? So that's a big sort of hour-long discussion of all these factors, the things that feel good, the things that don't feel good possibly for both parties, for both people. And I always try at the end of the workshop to remember to tell people about, okay, you can do hop. You can make sure that, the, that there's a commitment that people don't miss out on sustained interaction. So, I guess that's all I want to say about HOP. It's research informed. Um, we did manage to do a study, but I didn't get it out to publication because of life, baby and other things. I'd love to see more people get on board. I'd love to see more literature. There has been some studies done in Finland um, and I'll include a link for them. But bring it back to the essence. 10 minutes, present with the person, giving them 100% of your attention. I'll leave it there. Feel free to email me.
sherry at sheridanforster.com.au feel free to join the hot facebook group where i'm constantly sharing research practice random thoughts <laughs> from sitting in the middle of the bush in australia Thank you for listening to me.